Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission Three. director. You have permission Two. to launch. We have ignition of the RS-68A main engine. And we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket. Mark 1, execute. And we have an indication of spacecraft separation. At Space Launch Complex 37, a Delta IV rocket is fueled and ready to launch the second next-generation GPS-3 satellite for the United States Air Force Space and Missile System Center. Good morning and welcome to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. I'm Tyler Strickland, a trajectory engineer from ULA's mission design team. We are currently proceeding to, uh, towards liftoff at 9.01 a.m. Eastern. The launch team is not working any issues at this time. You may have noticed the change in launch time. That's due to one momentary collision avoidance period during today's window. We are currently in a planned 30-minute hold. We have two planned holds in today's nine-and-a-half-hour launch countdown. These planned holds give our team additional time to resolve any issues that come up prior to entering the terminal count. Will Ulrich, the 45th Space Wing's weather officer, recently briefed the launch team on current weather conditions here at Cape Canaveral. Here are the numbers. The probability of violating launch constraints is 20%. The ground winds are 10 knots out of the southeast, and the temperature is 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So the weather is within the launch commit criteria, and it looks favorable for our plan T0 at 9.01 a.m. Eastern. Roger that. Proceed. Live coverage of today's mission will conclude following the main engine cutoff number one. However, let's take a look at the events we'll see today from liftoff through SV separation of GPS-3. Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket. The Delta IV RS-68A engine and two solid rocket motors ignite lift the rocket away from the pad. The two solid rocket motors, or SRMs, generate the additional power required at liftoff, with each providing an additional 281,000 pounds of thrust. Shortly after liftoff, Delta IV begins a pitch-over to attain the proper flight path, while minimizing the pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. The Delta IV reaches Mach 1 at the speed of sound at 42 seconds. The SRMs burn out one minute, 33 seconds into flight. Seven seconds later, the SRMs are jettisoned. Approaching main engine cutoff, Delta IV is burning propellant at a rate of 1,000 pounds per second, located 90 miles in altitude and 227 miles downrange. At three minutes, 56 seconds, propellant levels deplete and the booster engine shuts down. Seven seconds later, the Delta IV separation system activates to release the first stage. The vehicle now weighs a little less than 9% of what it did at liftoff. At four minutes, 17 seconds, the second stage main engine ignites. The second stage and GPS satellite are now in the first burn. This burn will last approximately nine minutes. During ascent, GPS-3 Magellan is protected inside a four meter diameter payload fairing. At approximately 4 minutes 26 seconds, the payload fairing is jettisoned. 13 and a half minutes into flight, cutoff of the main engine, or MECO-1, occurs. The mission now enters a 53-minute coast phase. One hour, six minutes, and 47 seconds after liftoff, the engine is restarted for a second burn. Approximately three and a half minutes later, the second main engine cutoff occurs. At 1 hour, 55 minutes, 26 seconds, the second stage releases the GPS-3 Magellan satellite from the Air Force's Space and Missile Systems Center. Roger. ULA is using the Delta IV Medium Plus 4-2 rocket for today's mission. This is the 40th Delta IV launch in ULA's 135th mission. Built in Decatur, Alabama, the Delta IV Medium Plus 4-2 includes a common booster core powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-68A engine and two Northrop Grumman solid rocket motors. An Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10B2 engine powers the Delta Cryogenic second stage and a 4-meter diameter payload fairing protects the satellite during ascent. 
Events leading to launch began June 26, when the GPS-3 spacecraft, otherwise known as Magellan, was encapsulated inside its payload fairing. On July 31st, the encapsulated payload fairing was transported to the Mobile Service Tower, or MST, at Space Launch Complex 37 and made it to the Delta IV rocket. Approximately eight hours ago, final preparations began at Space Launch Complex 37. Using 40 hydraulic cylinders at pressures nearing 3,500 PSI, the 10 million pound MST was raised eight inches and rolled back, revealing the Delta IV launch vehicle. Using a carriage transporter system traveling at about a quarter mile an hour, it takes about 25 minutes to roll the MST to its launch position 345 feet north of the Delta IV rocket. The Delta IV rocket stands 207 feet tall, or about 20 stories. The RS-68A main engine and two solid rocket motors combined to produce more than 1.2 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. About four minutes later, at stage separation, it weighs just 10% of what it did at liftoff. This is Delta Mission Control at T-minus four minutes in holding. Today's flight will bring the second uh, satellite of the GPS-3 constellation to orbit. This satellite is referred to as Magellan. It is estimated that more than 4 billion military, commercial, and civil users worldwide connect with the Global Positioning System, or GPS. As essential as GPS is, the Air Force has committed to modernizing the entire system with new technology to make way for advanced capabilities and to build in flexibility to address future mission needs. Developed and built by Lockheed Martin for the Air Force, the more powerful GPS-3 satellites provide three times better accuracy, eight times improved anti-jamming capabilities, and a new L1C civil signal to improve worldwide connectivity for civilian users. On one. Verify base bending moment instrument. Later in the broadcast, we're, we'll learn more about the GPS-3 Magellan mission when I'm joined by Major Jenny G from the Air Force's Space and Missile System Center. I recently had an opportunity to speak with ULA trajectory engineer Zach Henning, so we'll take a look at that count conversation. And we'll wrap up with a tribute to the Delta IV medium rocket. This morning's flight is the last for this configuration. In addition to watching our webcast, you can follow live mission progress at ulalaunch.com. MAQ, LC, net one. Go, LC. At step 1230, initiate retract data logger just prior to the L7 pole. Roger. The GPS directorate based at the Air Force Space and Missile Systems Center provided the artwork we see on the rocket's payload fairing. Let's take a look behind the art. The green banner contains the Directorate's motto, while the globe depicts the Earth as viewed from space and as the origin and control point for the GPS constellation. The grid lines emphasize the global accuracy of the GPS signal, and the six pulsars symbolize the six planes of the constellation and atomic clocks providing the never-ending heartbeat of precise timing. The three orbital planes represent the three generations of GPS satellites, and the Heritage Compass Rose symbolizes early wisdom and navigation. Finally, the three stars in the black field represent the three GPS segments, space, ground, and user equipment. Today's flight is dedicated in memory of Bill Kisenberth and Tim Davis. Bill Kisenberg's career began in 1958 when he joined the Hydraulics Design Department at Douglas Aircraft's Missiles and Space Division. Bill was assigned to the Nike Zeus Anti-Ballistic Missile Program. In 1970, Bill joined the Delta team as manager of mechanical systems and spent the rest of his more than 57-year career working on the Delta program, much of it leading the Mechanical Ground Support Equipment Design Team. Bill's accomplishments included serving as the project manager for the Delta II and Delta III facility modifications and as the lead engineer for MGSE design in support of the successful launch of NASA's EFT-1 Orion mission in 2014. Bill was an active member of his community, assuming leadership roles in his neighborhood, church, and high school sports. 
He was devoted to his wife of 59 years and their four children and grandchildren. Bill was loyal, organized, and took pride in accomplishing meaningful things. He is sincerely missed by all who had the pleasure of working with him. This morning's flight is also dedicated in memory of Tim Davis. Tim Davis joined Quality Assurance Team in 1999 at Boeing, now ULA's, Decatur, Alabama production facility. He began in the Precision Measurement Group and later became a quality engineer for the Major Structures Group. Tim was well respected by his peers for his technical ability and well liked for his personality. Tim was devoted to his wife of 19 years and their children. He loved working on his farm, taking care of their horses, being involved in his church and his children's sports activities. He was a quiet and loving husband and father and was a pleasure to be around. He is sorely missed by both his family and colleagues. RC. Verify solar radiation limits acceptable for launch. Verified. Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint, any time after the terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel one, identify their station, and briefly state the reason for the hold. Flight control, LC. Flight control. Perform launch on time verification. Roger. L minus nine minutes. OSM, verify the hold fire switch is in the proceed position. Ready to proceed. RLM, verify red line monitor and event table are in the correct configuration for terminal count. Verified. L minus eight minutes. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. We remain in the planned 30 minute built in hold as preparations for launch continue. In a few moments, launch conductor Dylan Rice will pull the launch team for the final go to pick up the countdown. 27 engineers and managers are pulled for system status and readiness to proceed. This is the final status check before launch for all Delta vehicle systems, ground systems, the spacecraft, and the U.S. Air Force Eastern Range. The vehicle system readiness poll includes electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Let's listen in as Dylan Rice performs the final polling of the launch team. No flight control. Step 1330, launch on time, verified. Roger. LC, fuel two. Go, fuel two. Second stage LH2 30 minute conditioning is complete. Roger. We will be extending this built in hold an additional five minutes to complete second stage propellant conditioning. Fuel two, LC. Go. Step 1060, perform second stage LH2 fill and drain valve cycle test. Roger. L minus six minutes.
LC, LD on one. Go, LD. Please coordinate a new T0 of 13 colon 06 colon 00 Zulu. Roger, 13 Zulu. RC, LC, net one. Go ahead. Please coordinate a new T0 of 13 colon 06 colon 00 Zulu. Roger. ALC, LC, one. Go ahead. Please set the clock for a new T0 of 130600 Zulu. In work. With the extension of the hold, we now have a new T0 planned for 9.06 a.m. Eastern. Roger. LCRC1. Go, RC. Uh, range is approved, new T0. Roger. And for the team on net one, this is the LC. Uh, with the completion of the, the valve cycles, we are ready to proceed into our terminal count status check. L minus eight minutes. LC switch to ready position. All steps complete prior to the status check. Status check to proceed with terminal count, first aid systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Second stage systems, locks. Go. LH2. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. Calm. Go. TC cubed. Go. Operation support. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Hazgas. Go. ECS. Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. L minus six minutes. Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission Director. This is the Mission Director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. MEQ established. Swing arm lock pins pulled. Roger. Pulling is complete and the launch team has given the go for launch. The countdown will resume approximately two minutes from now. At T minus four minutes and counting, we enter the terminal count and begin securing the second stage liquid oxygen tank. At T minus 3 minutes and 32 seconds, booster liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tank securing is started. 
which includes closing the propellant fill and drain valves. Also at T minus 3 minutes and 32 seconds, vehicle transfer from ground facility power to its own internal battery power will be complete. At T minus 3 minutes, the vehicle ordnance system will be armed and booster liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen propellant tanks are verified to be at flight pressure and flight level. At 2 minutes prior to liftoff, the team will verify that the hydraulic system is pressurized as well as confirm booster, DCSS, and flight termination system battery voltages. At T minus 1 minute and 20 seconds, the team will begin securing the second stage liquid hydrogen tank. At T minus 60 seconds, the eastern range readiness is verified. At T minus 50 seconds, the DCSS liquid hydrogen tank is secured at flight level. A final launch vehicle and spacecraft status check is conducted at T minus 30 seconds. At T minus 15 seconds, the ROFIs, or sparklers, are ignited to burn off excess hydrogen at the base of the vehicle. Liftoff will occur at T zero. After liftoff, We'll hear the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicle ascent data. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. We anticipate releasing the hold in just a few moments. T minus four minutes and counting. 355. The countdown clock has resumed. We've entered the terminal count and we are go for launch at 9.06 a.m. Eastern. Second stage lock, secure at flight level. Three oh seven. Forty nine FDS internal CBC locks at flight pressure and flight level CBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. Two minutes, 159. Vehicle internal. 155. Launch sequencer start. Hydraulic pressure. At 4,000. One forty FCS launch and thirty seven T minus ninety seconds. The launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and eastern range are go for launch. One twenty OCU's arm FCS count started. T minus one, one minute. minute. Engine start box go. Rock report range status. Range green. Fifty. Second stage LH two secure at flight level. 30 seconds. Status check. Go Delta. Go GPS.
23. SRM, TBC, blowdown. 15. Rofi ignition. T minus 10. 10. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. We have ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the GPS-3 Magellan mission for the United States Air Force Space and Missile Systems Center. Body rate response looks good. Now 15 seconds into flight. You are hearing the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicle ascent data. Chamber pressure looks good. Seeing good chamber pressure across both SRMs. 25 seconds into flight. Continuing to see good operating parameters on the R68A main engine. Chamber pressure on both SRMs continues to look good. Seeing good body rates on the vehicle. Now 40 seconds into flight. Vehicle is now passing Mach 1. Delta 4 is now supersonic. Now 50 seconds in. Main engine continuing to perform well. Continuing to see a good burn profile on both SRMs. And vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Main engine continuing to perform well. Continuing to see good SRM chamber pressure profiles. One minute, 15 seconds into flight. Approximately 15 seconds remaining till SRM burnout. SRM chamber pressure is tailing off. And we have burnout on both SRMs. Standing by for separation. And we have separation of both solid rocket motors. Vehicle is now going to closed loop guidance. Body rate response looks good. Seeing minor correction in the roll attitude as expected. And the Delta IV rocket now weighs just one half of its liftoff weight. Second stage ACS system pressurization valve has been opened. RCS uh, pressure response looks good. Now two minutes, five seconds into flight. And vehicle is now passing through Mach 5. Delta IV is now 36 miles in altitude, 55 miles downrange distance, traveling at 4,760 miles per hour. Two minutes, 30 seconds into flight. Chamber pressure on the R68A main engine continues to look good. Body rate responses also continue to look good. Two minutes, 45 seconds into flight. And upper stage lock system has begun the boost phase chill down sequence to begin thermal conditioning of the upper stage engine. Now less than one minute remaining in the first stage phase of flight. And upper stage fuel system has begun boost phase chill down. Now three minutes, 15 seconds into flight. Delta IV is now 65 miles in altitude, 148 miles downrange distance, traveling at 8,500 miles per hour. Now passing three minutes, 30 seconds into flight. Main engine continues to perform well. Chamber pressure looks good. Body rate responses on the Delta IV also look good. About 10 seconds remaining until booster throttle down. And booster's now throttling down to the minimum power level in preparation for BECO. Standing by for BECO. And we have BECO booster engine cutoff. Standing by for stage separation. We have good indication of stage separation. The upper stage engine nozzle extension is deploying. We have pre-start on the RL-10. Standing by for ignition. We have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10 engine. Chamber pressure looks good. Body rates look good. Standing by for payload fairing jet. And we have payload fairing jettison. 
Delta Mission Control at T plus four and a half minutes. We've just heard Patrick Moore report the successful execution of the early events of today's flight, and all systems continue to operate nominally. The Delta IV second stage and GPS-3 satellite are traveling in a northeasterly direction up the U.S. eastern seaboard. This mission is now in the first of two planned RL-10 engine burns. This burn will last approximately nine minutes. Joining me now is GPS-3 Launch Integration and Operations Chief, Major Jenny G. Welcome. Thanks, Tyler. I'm excited to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about the GPS-3 mission? Sure. So GPS-3 is the newest generation of satellites that is required to maintain the GPS constellation, and it's going to provide improved positioning, navigation, and timing services to meet user demands now and in the future. Just to name a few new capabilities, um, we have the new L1C Global Navigation Satellite System Interoperability Signal. We have higher signal power, greater accuracy, and longer spacecraft lifetime, as well as more signal availability. And there will be even more to come once the new ground control system becomes operational. And this will help GPS-3 um, maintain its status as the gold standard for worldwide satellite navigation. And uh, you had mentioned before that we were the GPS um, SPO, the direct directorate, but at the center we're currently shifting to a new paradigm called SMC 2.0. And GPS-3 is going to be an integral program as we move into the new production core and that will help lay the groundwork for how we provide improved support to our warfighter through our space capabilities and how we're going to improve leveraging our partnerships, um, find new ways to cultivate innovation and decision speed. So you talked a lot about uh, where you're going, but I'm curious about some of the older GPS satellites. What's the oldest one that's actively working on orbit? So our oldest working satellite um, is SVN-34, and that is a GPS-2A that was launched back in October 1993 by a ULA Delta II launch vehicle. Um, so for comparison, GPS-3 SVs have a 15-year design life. This is already 25% longer than the last generation of GPS-2F satellites. Those came with a 12-year design life. So SVN-34, it was manufactured by Rockwell, and it was the 14 of 19 Block 2A GPS satellites that were launched. It had a 7.5-year uh, design life, and so far it's been 24 years and it's still ticking. Wow. I mean, speaking of the manufacturing, so where's the GPS-3 satellites? Where are they being produced? So to ensure the most efficient GPS-3 production process, GPS-3, they're assembled at Lockheed Martin's multi-capability GPS processing facility in Waterton, Colorado. This is the assembly, integration, and test location for the entire GPS-3 fleet. Um, that facility was officially opened in February of 2012. It was built in the company's former rocket assembly building. Um, that facility has nearly 50,000 square feet of spacecraft assembly and test area, and it includes a clean room high bay, a dedicated thermal vacuum, and anechoic test chambers. Um, that high bay was designed to maximize efficiency by minimizing the number of space vehicle lifts and uh, minimizes the distances between operations. So just like aircraft and autom automobile production lines, each GPS-3 satellite will move through a sequential uh, series of workstations for various assembly and integration operations. And it will all culminate with environmental test procedures. Okay, so how exactly, you know, how dependent is the world on the GPS constellation? So there was actually an article published recently on uh, June 14th on Ars Technica summarizing a study that was sponsored by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and that estimated that a complete loss of GPS subfunction would cost the world over a billion dollars a day over a simulated 30-day outage period. They approximate that from 1984, when GPS was first made uh, available for commercial use, that GPS has generated $1.4 trillion in economic benefits. So GPS has improved bandwidth and reliability for wireless networks in the telecommunications industry. It made 4G LTE implementation possible with access to highly precise timing. And it has increased efficiency for vehicle dispatch and navigation, which is especially important for large-scale <coughs> agriculture. And it has made location-based services and apps available for smartphone users. So furthermore, there are new sectors of the economy, such as autonomous transport and Internet of Things, and they continue to find innovative and lucrative ways to take advantage of the precision, um, position, navigation, and timing made available by GPS free to the world. Well, well, I can definitely say that it's important to all of us. Thank you so much for spending some time explaining it to us, Major G. It was my pleasure, Tyler. Thank you. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 10 and a half minutes. All systems continue to operate nominally. The rocket's trajectory continues on a northeasterly heading.
I recently caught up with fellow trajectory engineer Zach Henney. Let's take a look. So Zach, as a fellow trajectory engineer, I've heard a lot about GPS, but I know there's a lot more to it that I haven't heard about. So can you kind of explain to the audience today what is interesting about today's flight? Uh, first little interesting tidbit is we're going up the pretty much the entire east coast of the United States. Okay. It should be visible through most of the southeast, but we will be hugging the coast all the way up through the northeast, on through the Canadian coastline, and then off and over Europe and we'll be swooping back down around. We'll be doing our second burn south of Australia and we're coming into uh, line of sight of an Air Force receiving station on Hawaii. It'll be driving our spacecraft separation time. 25 minutes after we come into view there we'll be separating the spacecraft. We're doing our third burn actually right above Denver. Um, fortunately nobody back there can see it because it's during the daytime and then come back in for a re-entry in the ocean south of uh, South Africa. So this mission has a relatively short window compared to other launches, um, but you guys had a clever way of getting more out of that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so it's only 26 and a half to 27 minutes that we have to work with. So we're launching every 30 seconds, so at the top and the bottom of the minute to take full advantage of that. And that's really driven by the GPS constellation itself, where we have six orbital planes that the constellation is in, mm -hmm. and we had to deliver the spacecraft into one of those planes to the target that was given to us by our customer. And to make things work and give us the best opportunity to get it on orbit, we decided to go every 30 seconds and work it like that. Awesome. So essentially that just doubles the amount of opportunities we would normally have with because of that short window. Yep, exactly and makes for quirky things like 9 a.m. in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I also know that this is your first mission. You know, you've been at ULA for a few years, mm -hmm. but you've been working on this mission for a while. Could you kind of walk us through what all of you d worked on and, and how you're feeling about the launch today? Yeah, so I picked it up two years ago this month in August of 2017, where we started with the preliminary mission analysis, which really gave us a good first look at the mission and what we were going to expect going into our more detailed analyses as we moved along and from there with every trajectory iteration just refined it more and more and eventually it got closer to what we're flying and things started to get real <laughs> <laughs> and then coming out here this week uh, it was exciting being able to drive up here to the Delta Operations Center for the first time and just seeing the pad lit up in the dark sky behind it and really sank in that we're launching this bird. Awesome. So Zach, what's your role on launch day and where will you be? So on launch day, I'm in the engineering support area here at the Delta Operations Center. I'm on console for flight mechanics and I'm monitoring the state of the rocket through the various phases of the flight and making sure that everything looks good. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for taking some time to talk with me. I know you're really busy this week, so really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 13 minutes and counting. The Delta IV rocket carrying the GPS-3 Magellan satellite lifted off from Space Launch Complex 37 at 9.06 a.m. Eastern Time. We're now approaching the first main engine cutoff. Let's join Patrick Moore for mission progress. In about 20 seconds. RL-10 engine operating parameters continue to look good. And about 10 seconds remaining until Miko. Standing by for cutoff. And we have Miko, main engine cutoff. Body rate responses damping out nicely from the shutdown transient. We just heard Patrick Moore report Miko 1. The mission now enters a long coast phase. We'll conclude our live coverage in a few minutes, but stay up to date with the rest of today's flight by following our blog. Before we sign off, we'd like to take a few minutes to remember the work done in service to our nation and the world by our Delta IV medium family of rockets. Though the Delta IV Heavy will continue to launch our nation's largest payloads, today marks the final flight of the Delta IV single-state configuration. Here's a look at its legacy. On November 20, 2002, the first Delta IV rocket lifted off from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 37. Flying in the Medium Plus configuration, the new single-stick rocket had two solid rocket motors for extra thrust at liftoff and a four-meter payload fairing 
protecting Eutelsat's W-5 satellite on its trip to orbit. Delta IV development began in partnership with the Air Force's evolved expendable launch vehicle program in the mid-1990s. The result, a family of five launch vehicles tailored to accommodate a range of payloads from medium to heavy class. All Delta IV rockets begin with a common booster core powered by the RS-68A main engine. Solid rocket motors provide added thrust, while the choice of a four or five meter diameter payload fairing allowed the Delta IV medium to more precisely accommodate varying payload sizes. Single stick Delta IV rockets lofted nearly 30 missions to space. The satellites launched by these rockets delivered advanced missile warning, weather forecasting, navigation and communications capability for the Air Force, critical classified payloads for the National Reconnaissance Office, and next generation weather satellites for NASA. Good engine control on the first stage. Though it's an end of an era, the Delta IV's legacy as a workhorse lives on with the Delta IV Heavy. With its three common booster cores, the Heavy continues to launch our nation's largest missions to space. Launch of the Air Force's GPS-3 Magellan satellite closes the chapter on Delta IV single-stick rockets, but its legacy and service to our nation and the world lives on in the capabilities it enabled. I'd like to thank Major Jenny G. and Patrick Moore for their contributions to today's program. For more information about the mission, visit our websites at our, also our Facebook and Twitter pages, or as I mentioned earlier, our launch blog at ULALaunch.com. We'll leave you now with another look at liftoff of the Delta IV rocket carrying the Air Force's second GPS-3 satellite. I'm Tyler Strickland. On behalf of the entire launch team, thank you for joining us and have a great day. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, we have ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the GPS-3 Magellan mission for the United States Air Force Space and Missile Systems Center. Body rate response looks good. Now 15 seconds into flight. You are hearing the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicle engine chamber pressure data. looks good, seeing good chamber pressure across both SRMs. 25 seconds into flight. Continuing to see good operating parameters.